So I think um, it's time to get started. Uh, welcome everybody to our symposium, um, the University, the UCLA Library and the International and Area Studies Department. Welcome you to our symposium, Contested Collections, Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Jade Alboro. I'm the librarian for Southeast Asian Studies and Pacific Island Studies here at UCLA. And I am also um, one of the co-leads for this symposium's planning team. So before I, um, we get started, I just wanted to mention a few things. We are re recording this event. You should have gotten that notification. Um, there's closed captioning available. If you want to enable that function, you click on the CC button. And if you want to submit questions to the speakers and moderators, please use the Q&A um, feature because that's the one that we'll be monitoring. monitoring. Um, and if you have technical difficulties, contact us um, via chat to the host and pan panelists and we'll try to figure that out for you. So this morning's program is, is titled Returning Home, Reclaiming Nazi Looted Jewish Materials. And so this is the order of the day. Um, after I do this opening, um, we will have welcome remarks from Virginia Steele, our university librarian. I will introduce the moderator and she in turn will introduce each speaker and then the speakers will um, do their presentations. And then after that, there'll be a moderated discussion. And then after that, we'll have a QA. and a um, So that is what is happening. <laughs> and so um, without further ado, um, I do want us to get started. And so here are some remarks from Virginia Steele, our university librarian. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this symposium, Contested Collections, Grappling with History and Forging Pathways for Repatriation. My name is Ginny Steele, and I am the Norman and Armina Powell University Librarian at the UCLA Library. As we begin today, I would like to acknowledge that as a land grant institution, we at UCLA acknowledge the Gabrielino Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers of Tovangar, which includes the Los Angeles Basin and the South Channel Islands. Consistent with our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we believe that understanding the historical and current experiences of Indigenous peoples informs the work we do. So again, thank you for coming today. We're really happy to have you here as we open this discussion about repatriation, particularly repatriation as it applies to materials that are held in libraries and archives. As many of us may have realized when thinking about the general topic of repatriation, much of the discussion we've heard over the last several decades has focused on artifacts in museums and art held in museums and galleries, but there's been relatively little attention paid to materials that are in libraries and archives. At UCLA, we were contacted a few years ago by a Jewish institution in Munich to return a book to our collection that belonged to their library but was looted by the Nazis. We gladly returned the item but didn't think much more about it. Then last year, we were contacted another time, a second time, this time by the Jewish Museum in Prague. A curator there contacted Diane Mizrahi, our librarian for Jewish and Israel studies. They had identified three books through Hadi Trust that rightfully belonged to their library. The scanned images in Hadi Trust included their property stamps and accession numbers. When Diane communicated the news to her colleagues in the International and Area Studies Department in the UCLA Library, their outreach team led by Jade Alburo felt that it was important not just to share what UCLA is doing in repatriating these books, but to use it as a jumping off point to initiate a broader dialogue about repatriation, why there's a need for it in the first place and why it continues to be a difficult and complicated discussion. This symposium provides a more global context for this conversation by acknowledging the long history of colonialism, war, and even field research that has led to cultural heritage materials being taken from their communities and countries. As libraries, 
archives and other cultural memory institutions begin to talk about decolonizing their collections, it is crucial to recognize that decolonization is not just about adding underrepresented voices to our collections, but it's also about understanding how materials in our collections came to be there, how they were obtained, whether they were taken from their original owners without their consent, and whether and how they should be returned to the communities and individuals from whom they were taken. In this symposium, you will hear about various issues related to repatriation, including notions of ownership and caretaking. You'll hear examples from museums and libraries because we hope that many institutions will be interested in exploring and implementing reparative practices. You will also hear examples of existing policies and procedures that institutions and government agencies have put in place. And we'll have some ideas for working with the communities that own the materials in the first place. We're very happy to have you with us as we explore this for ourselves and determine what our next steps should be. At the UCLA Library, we are very committed to restitution and we do expect to do more in the future. We hope you will be too. I'd like to thank everyone at UCLA who's been involved in the planning of this symposium. Jade Alboro and Tula Oram for leading the planning team, as well as members Elena Ising, Dana Laterer, and Yesenia Perez. Additional thanks to Sharon Farb, Shannon Tanhai Ahari, Giselle Rios, Magali Salas, the library communications team, and library business services. And thank you to the UCLA Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies for co-sponsoring the symposium. I, we appreciate all the hard work of all these individuals and the contributions that have been made. And we thank you for bringing us all together. And to our uh, viewers and members of the audience, thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to continued discussion with many of you as we all try to figure out what the best way is to approach the need for us to look at our collections and identify materials that were taken without consent from their owners and return them to the communities and individuals where they belong. Enjoy the symposium. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, and thank you, Ginny. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you our, moder our moderator, Dr. Renata Fuchs. Dr. Renata Fuchs is a lecturer of German language and literature in the Department of European Languages and Transcultural Studies at UCLA and a freelance translator, writer, and editor. Her research areas include German Jewish literature, Holocaust studies, and intellectual history of German Romanticism along with its relevance for today. Her most recent publication appeared this year in the Oxford Handbook of Women Philosophers in the 19th Century and her book of translation about the last survivors of the Warsaw Ghetto uprising is available in the special collections of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Everyone, please welcome Dr. Renata Fuchs. Well, thank you for the introduction. Uh, many thanks uh, to the US UCLA Library for organizing this critical symposium on repatriation and inviting me to uh, moderate this panel of um, indeed historical significance. And I'm truly delighted to be here and to uh, help lead the discussion. So let me introduce uh, to you our first speaker, Dr. Lisa Leff. Uh, she's a historian of European and Jewish history, specializing in the history of Jews in modern France. She's a professor of history uh, at American University. Uh, she's the author of Sacred Bonds of Solidarity, uh, The Rise of Jewish Internationalism in 19th Century France, uh, also of Colonialism and the Jews, and The Archive Thief, The Man Who Salvaged French Jewish History in the Wake of the Holocaust, which uh, received the 2016 Sammy Rohr Prize for Jewish Literature. She also directs the Mandel Center at the United States Holocaust Museum. 
a research institute uh, dedicated to advancing the field of Holocaust studies around the world. Welcome, Dr. Lisa Leff. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for that um, wonderful introduction. And thank you so much to the organizers for putting this together. I'm so thrilled to be part of it. In my talk today, I'd like to focus on the story of the restitution of books looted from Jews by the Nazis, um, a restitution effort that was led by the Allied forces in the aftermath of the war. I want to focus especially um, not only on how and why these books got looted uh, by the Nazis, uh, not only how and why the Allies dedicated themselves to returning those books, but also, um, and maybe most importantly, I wanna put the focus on the Jews uh, who cared so very much about those restitution efforts um, and why as a result of the, these organized Jewish efforts to do something about that loot, these books, mostly wound up in places far from where they had been looted in the hands of new institutions rather than returned to where they had come from. I wanna begin with the Nazis though, uh, so that you understand how Jewish books were looted. Um, at the end of, this is actually a photo of allies. Um, at the end of World War II, the Allies recovered material looted from the Jews by the Nazis. And this is a picture of an Allied um, leader uh, with some of the loot that they recovered. The Nazis lo looted all sorts of things from Jews. They took precious objects from synagogues. They also took many things from individuals. Perhaps what you're most familiar with would be high value items like art. Um, they also took musical instruments. They also took items from very um, humble people, items like household property, pots and pans, furniture. And they also took books and archives. They took these materials from libraries of individuals. So families that had extensive collections saw those entire book collections looted. They also took from synagogue libraries and they took from very large Jewish community archives and libraries, um, places where Jews studied and did research. Nazis looted for three major reasons. Um, first of all, when it came to high value items like art, they looted to sell some of these items to finance their efforts. Another aspect though of the plunder was, you know, we have to consider that looting is part of the genocide. The Nazis were trying to destroy not only Jewish people, but also Jewish culture, everything about Jewish life. So taking away Jewish cultural treasures was part of that effort. And then perhaps the creepiest part, the creepiest reason for Nazi plunder of books in particular, was that the Nazis wanted to study the Jews. They saw Jews as their enemy and they thought that it was really important to study the enemy based on their own sources. And to that end, the Nazis built what, what was to that time, the largest Jewish library in history centered in Frankfurt. It was called the Institute for the Study of the Jewish Question. And on this slide, I'm showing you the stamp that they put um, in the books that they gathered in this institute. And you know, today, dispersed throughout the world, you can find books that uh, Jewish books that have been through um, this looting and restitution process. And the telltale sign of it is this stamp. I want to step back for a moment. So that's the Nazi moment, but I mean. In order to understand why this mattered, the other thing, the other side of this is the question of why these collections existed in the first place, right? Libraries were an important part of modern Jewish life in the 20th century. 
Jews always cared about books. Jews call themselves the people of the book. But the idea of a library that goes beyond religious sources and has um, you know, all sorts of literature produced by Jews, that's more of a 20th century phenomenon. And we see it emerging across Europe in many different settings where Jews had begun to see themselves as more than just a religion, also a civilization that was worth studying in its own right. And in many Jewish subcultures, we had scholars and journalists using libraries to study who the Jews were. It was in a way a part of the modernization of Jewish life. Here um, is a picture of uh, the largest Jewish library in Europe, uh, the Alliance Universelle, the Alliance Israelite Universelle Library in Paris as it looked uh, on the eve of the war. During the war with the invasion of the Nazis, Jews across Europe worked hard to protect these collections. We see it in many places. This is a picture from Vilna where Jews were put in ghettos at the end of 1941 and a number of um, Jewish librarians and cultural leaders were given the horrible task by the Nazis of going through the most important Jewish libraries in that city. You know, Vilna was home to two of the most important Jewish libraries in Europe, the Strashun Library and the Yivo Library. So um, when the Nazis came to Vilna, they um, employed as slave laborers, Jewish librarians and gave them the horrific task of sorting through those libraries to decide what items should, should be sent to that Nazi Institute in Frankfurt and what items should be destroyed. And so here is one of those Jewish librarians doing that horrific task. This group of Jewish librarians is remembered as the paper brigade. They acted um, very heroically and uh, you know, disobeying Nazi orders, risked their lives to hide and save many items from being pulped or sent to the Nazis, burying them, them underground in the Nazis and that from, uh, from the Nazis. And this is just one of many cases that we know of, of Jews trying to protect their libraries from Nazi looting. There are cases in Germany. Uh, there are case, there's a case in Amsterdam. There's, a case, there's cases in France. It's really something that happened across Europe. So that's the wartime part of the story. Allies knew, so the Americans, the Soviets, the British, they knew that this was happening. Um, Jewish refugees who had made it to New York were very aware and were writing in newspapers and, and petitioning the allies saying, it's not only the Jewish people are being destroyed, it's the Jewish cultural institutions are being destroyed. And if Jews are gonna exist after the war, we're gonna need those. And they were compiling lists of institutions, including libraries that were at risk. That's why the Allies knew that this looting was happening. And in 1943, already during the war, the Allies came together in London and uh, made a pledge to return everything they found to the people from whom it had been looted. So uh, um, unprecedented in history level of commitment to restitution. This meant that when they ran across Nazi loot, and I'm talking here about art, about um, high value items um, that were found in castles, but I'm also primarily gonna talk to you about books. Um, when, the, when the Americans and the British ran across this stuff, they knew they couldn't just ignore it. They had pledged themselves to restitution. So what they did initially was bring it to what they called collecting points. There were three different collecting points in occupied Germany. And what I'm showing you here is the picture of Offenbach Archival Depot. This was the center for the restitution of looted Jewish books. And it was located in a warehouse outside of Frankfurt. Frankfurt made sense as a place for this because that's where that Nazi Institute was. That's where the largest number of Jewish books already were. And Offenbach was a small town on the outskirts of Frankfurt. By the time all the looted books were found and brought to Offenbach, we are talking about 3 million books that the allies had pledged that they would return. 
This was a daunting task and the allies knew from the start, they didn't really have the capacity to do what they had pledged. They knew that most of the individual owners were probably dead. They also knew that most of the libraries and synagogues from which this stuff had been stolen were destroyed. So this made them think about their task in a certain way. And they thought back to the principles, the basic principles of international law for dealing with such things. And the legal principle that they operated on was actually already in that inter-allied declaration of 1943. It was what they had pledged themselves to, which was the idea that if the individual owner could not be found and you wanted to do restitution, it would go to the country from which it had been looted. Now, when it came to Jewish property, this uh, legal principle, it didn't fit quite right. Let's take this one case. Here's a um, railroad car full of books that in 1946 were being returned to Poland. In World War II, at the, you know, at the beginning of World War II, the largest Jewish community in Europe was Poland, but 90% of Polish Jews were killed in the Holocaust, 90%. What would happen to these books being returned to newly liberated Poland? These are Jewish books in Jewish languages that the majority of Poles couldn't read, wouldn't appreciate. What would happen to them when they were returned? It wasn't a problem everywhere. In some countries, this principle did work well for the purposes of restitution. Let's take the example of France. In France, 75% of Jews survived the war and the institutions um, that had held library collections also survived. So for that reason, it was possible for the French state to actually appoint as representatives, the librarians who had worked with those collections. So one of the people that was sent to Offenbach to find French books was Rabbi Maurice Liebert. I'm showing you a picture of him here. He was the director of the rabbinical school of France, France's main seminary. He went to Offenbach himself. He identified the collection of, from his very institution and it was returned to his institution that way. While he was there, he also recognized the collection of that Library of the Alliance Israelite Universelle, and that collection also was returned. <clears throat> so in this case, in the case of France, France considered the looted Jewish books to be French collections, and that facilitated their return. But it didn't work as well in the case of Eastern European libraries, which were the majority of what was found in Offenbach. Jewish refugees who had made their way to New York were very vocal in petitioning the US State Department saying, what you're doing isn't gonna work. Um, they were upset for a number of reasons. One was, as I already alluded to when we talked about Poland, Jewish population was really devastated in Eastern Europe and it was hard to imagine sending Jewish books back to countries that had no Jews. They were also, many of these Jews in New York were very anti-communist. They were also very worried about materials being sent back to the Soviet Union where they imagined Jews in the West like themselves would have very little access and they didn't trust the Soviet authorities to make them available to Jews. Um, and I would say, you know, the, the trouble underlying the whole thing here is Jews were targeted by the Nazis as a national minority, and yet the law was really made for nation states. And it was very hard to do restitution to a national minority that, an international minority that had no standing in international law. Then there was the problem of the airless books, even after everything had been returned to the places where the countries where they had come from, there were 500,000 books left that authorities in Offenbach just simply didn't know where they came from. What would happen to these? 
I want to say something about the staff in Offenbach, because it was very interesting. The Allied authorities wanted to bring in people who could read Jewish languages in order to deal with these Jewish books, most of which were in Hebrew or Yiddish, languages that other allies couldn't read. So they put a man, one of the leaders was a man named Captain Isaac Bankowitz, himself um, an immigrant from Eastern Europe and Jewish who could read these languages. And he is the one who presided over this, this at this troubling time when things were being returned um, to the countries of origin. And I just wanted to show you a uh, quote from his diary that shows some of the challenges uh, that, that this process had for him. And I'm gonna read this middle paragraph. Um, I would pick up a, a badly worn Talmud with hundreds of names of many generations of students and scholars. Where were they now? Or rather, where were their ashes? In what incinerator were they destroyed? I would find myself straightening out these books and arranging them in the boxes with a personal sense of tenderness as if they had belonged to someone dear to me, someone recently deceased. He's very identified with these books, right? He sees them as Jewish books and he's not able, the law isn't able yet to, doesn't have a policy for restitution that could return them to Jews. They're returning them to the countries of origin. Facing the same sense of despair, other Jews who weren't in positions of authority in Offenbach took things into their own hands. This was the case with Jerusalem-based scholar Gershom Sholem, who was originally himself from Germany. He simply took restitution matters into his own hands. He traveled from Jerusalem to Germany, um, and he went to Offenbach. He was allowed in ostensibly to help identify what they were finding because he was an expert in medieval mysticism. As he read through these manuscripts and looked at what they were, he surreptitiously put them in piles with Roman numerals one, two, three, and four. One he thought were the highest value items. And he put them in these piles and left them there. Later, a friend of his, Rabbi Herbert Friedman, went into Offenbach and simply boxed up the number ones and had them illegally shipped to Jerusalem where they're now um, part of the Hebrew University Library. When the law didn't seem right, people like Gershom Sholem, and he wasn't the only one, simply took matters into his own hands to get these Jewish books back into Jewish hands. Another example of this is two other scholars, Lucy Davidovich and Koppel Pinson, both New York-based intellectuals who worked for the Joint Distribution Committee, which was an aid organization to help, a Jewish aid organization to help Jews that worked a lot with the DPs, with the displaced persons. They made their way to Germany to help the displaced persons. They came into Offenbach and got permission to borrow 25,000 books, ordinary books, for use by the DPs while they were stuck in these camps. They never returned them. Again, when it just seemed like policy didn't map on to what was right, some Jews who could uh, took matters into their restitution matters into their own hands. And then a final, uh, the most uh, legal strategy um, was adopted by a group of New York Jewish intellectuals who had been, you know, these were the people who had been complaining to the State Department that this policy wasn't right. This was the group around uh, the journal Jewish Social Studies. They formed a nonprofit organization in 1947 that they called Jewish Cultural Reconstruction. And they lobbied the State Department uh, to return at least the airless books to Jews rather than to European states. Here's what Hannah Arendt wrote about it in a publication from 1946. She wrote, in view of the wholesale destruction of Jewish life and property by the Nazis, reconstruction of Jewish cultural institutions cannot possibly mean restoration in their original form or in all cases to their previous location. Ultimately, it may seek to help redistribute the Jewish cultural treasures in accordance with the new needs created by the new situation of world Jewry. What she's saying here is these books were stolen from Jews 
those Jewish communities are now destroyed. Jewish life in Europe would, would not be rebuilt. And that meant that the Jewish books should go to new locations where Jewish life had a future. They succeeded. In 1947, Jewish cultural reconstruction was given the right to distribute those 500,000 airless books. And they did what you would expect given Hannah Arendt's views as expressed here. They took them out of Europe and distributed them to new homes in collections where they felt Jews could use them for research or community building. These were synagogue collections and research libraries in Israel, in South America, in South Africa, in Australia, and most of all in North America. Today, the only trace that remains of that history of that strange restitution is the book plates. You can find them in Jewish libraries across the world, though rarely in Europe itself because the beneficiaries were largely outside of Europe. The story, you probably didn't know it before, but it is so important. It helps us understand what got these books to where they are and the difficult ethical and legal problems that these books posed for the allies after the war. At that moment of the reckoning over the restitution, Jews felt that it, the law wasn't mapping onto what was right, in this case, a crime committed against a non-national minority under a law meant to deal with nation state. For those Jews involved, I wanna you know, end here with that question of what did this work mean to them? I wanna read part of this quote from one of the people involved in Jewish cultural reconstruction. He said, the repatriation of the identifiable books and articles resembled the return of kidnapped children to the former homes and the embrace of overjoyed parents who awaited them. I'm gonna stop that um, quote there, though you can keep looking at it. For those involved in these restitution efforts, these books were orphans. These books needed new parents and those parents had to be Jewish. And if those Jewish parents were outside of Europe, the books would leave Europe. Again, tells us something about how Jews understood the genocide and how they could reconstruct. Then I'm gonna end here with a picture of Ben Gurion, uh, the Israeli leader, walking with Rabbi Herbert Friedman. Rabbi Herbert Friedman was that friend of Gershom Sholem's who had helped surreptitiously take stuff out of um, Offenbach. He also accompanied Ben-Gurion to visit the DP camps. The, I wanted to show you that these two efforts was inextricably linked in the minds of these Jewish leaders. Friedman said, saving these books amounts to saving the people of the book, right? And if that future of the people of the book was outside of Europe, that's where restitution would take place. Thank you, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Les. Uh, we are moving on uh, to the next speaker who is Michael Buschek. Uh, he works as a Jewish studies researcher at the Jewish Museum in Prague. He studied at Charles University in Prague and holds a master's degree in biblical and Jewish studies from the faculty of uh, Husai theology. He wrote his thesis on problems of Shoah in Judaism. Uh, since 2001, he has been researching the provenance of the books. He oversees the agenda and uh, database of original owners of the books and researchers of library history. Uh, as a curator at the Jewish Museum in Prague, uh, he has designed three exhibitions and cooperated on establishing permanent exhibitions. He is a member of the expert panel for property transfer from the collections of the Jewish Museum in Prague. Uh, welcome, Michael Pulshek. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, 
Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this symposium and to share our experiences. Provenance research of libraries and book collections was many years wrongly neglected, and I'm happy that the last few years it received the same attention as the art object. Jewish Museum in Prague engaged in provenance research for many years. Important part of the provenance research makes documentation of museum losses and searching for the losses. Let me focus on museum book collection. The historical core of the book collection of the Prague Museum has made up by the uh, library of the Jewish region community in Prague. Let me start with short history excursion. The decision to found the library of the region uh, community library in Prague was taken in 1858 and it was the donation of the book collection of the philanthropist Isaac Tausik that provided the impetus for founding the library. The library, the library had expanded with additional donations from uh, important figures of Prague's Jewish town, such as Rabbi Reitelas, Rabbi Landau, or above all Rabbi Rapaport, whose collections remained separate from other books in this library. The library first opened its doors on 20, 20 April 1874. And uh, after some relocations, the library was housed in the Jewish town hall, uh, and it continued to grow with the uh, additions of uh, valuable collections, the most important being purchased from Kopelman Lieben, whose library remains separate from other books too. Here you can see uh, the library. In 1912, the library was joined by Tobias Jakobovich, the author of a book on its history and on several articles on its most important volumes. He was instrumental in putting together the library's cards and bound catalogs. In 1922, he became the library manager, remaining in this position until the library was confiscated by the Nazi authorities. In the article from 1938, it states that the community library continues about 25,000 books, which were uh, divided into three groups, Hebraica, Judaica, and Excuse me, sorry to interrupt, but we don't see you, you say your PowerPoint. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm very sorry. Can you see now? Yes, now, thank you. There should be like a slight different view because we see the slides on the side now. Yeah. Um, the bound catalog of Hebraica and Judaica were completed in the same year. Uh, and it was followed by the card catalog in 1949. The community library remained in operation until the start of Nazi occupation in March, 1939. It was then confiscated by the Nazi authorities and relocated. Jakobovic became uh, uh, the head of research at the newly founded Central Jewish Museum, so-called War Museum. And uh, he was there till October 44 when he was deported to Auschwitz, where he was perished. We do not know much about uh, the fate of the community library during the Second World War. Post-war archive materials show that the collection was split up for unknown reason and that parts of it were moved to other places in Prague and also were in protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. Upon its returns, it became evident that the library had suffered considerable losses, especially uh, its old and reprinted books. It was usually while uh, the writer and the member of post-war Jewish Museum who arranged for the takeover of the community library as early as May 1945. In his report, he shares an information from the head of the Oriental Institute about the fact that the community library, part of it, was located in the building of the Faculty of Science in Prague. Yusiva found the books built on the floor in the auditorium. Before the end of the war, Nazis wanted to burn them. 
while also discovered that parts of the community library have been taken to the village of Kaut near Domažice and to the Zata Koruna monastery, where they were still located. Jiří Vál visited the monastery on August 1945 and confirmed that part of the community library, mostly Hebraica, is located there. Reports dating from the years 1945-46 uh, refer to a box of ray printed books deposited in the basement of Chateau Co, which was uh, during the war used by German army and after the war uh, served as a base for US uh, troops after the liberation. The soldiers did not allow access to Chateau before the departure. The museum's director, Hanna Volavkova, herself went there to look for the books, but did not find them. No archival proof has been uh, found that the box of books have ever retrieved. It may be assumed that uh, the books were taken by the US Army or were uh, relocated to another institution. The transfer of books of community library was hampered by a lack of funds, manpower, and transport. In portion of a community library located in Prague was taken by the Jewish Museum in 1945. The books stored in the monastery were transferred in the autumn of 1946. Other individual books were tracked down and handed over to the museum in the following period from different Prague institutions. Due to a constant lack of staff and storage space, uh, it was not possible to check out the community library for comparison with the pre-war catalogs. The books in the library were not arranged until shortly before the public opening of the museum's library. After the founding of the State Jewish Museum in 1915, Otto Munoz became a leading figure of the library and the Jewish community library State uh, remains separated from the other uh, uh, book collection of the Jewish Museum. The State Jewish Museum ceased to exist in November 1994 when its collection were transferred to the Federation of Jewish Religion Communities in the Czech Republic. The later placed them in the re established Jewish Museum in Prague, which in 2001 relocated to a building next to the Spanish synagogue where now um, where new depositories were built. During the transfer of the book collections, an inventory of missing call number was carried out, which also involved the community library. And again, uh, this library was, remained separated from the other books. As I mentioned, uh, lots of books were missing from the uh, original uh, library com um, community library. So let me now tell you uh, something about searching for the missing book. One of the tasks of the Jewish Museum Library is to construct a history of the community library and to track down missing books for the purpose to confirm that they were not destroyed during the war. With regards to the period of the State Jewish Museum's extent, we have only sporadic information about the recovery and return of books from the community library. During the communist regime, no search for books from the community library was undertaken outside the Czech Republic. This was also the case in the first years following uh, the Velvet Revolution of 1989, when the museum's main focus was uh, on building depositories for its collection and uh, on renew, uh, creating new exhibitions. An intensive search for books missing from the community library has been underway for the last few years in a more uh, systematic way since 2018. Facilitated uh, largely by internet development, digitalization of collections, intensive provenance research concerning library co collections, uh, especially on European continent, the emergence of online databases of identified book owners, and also uh, online auction sales. The identification of the community library books is made possible by clear and conclusive provenance remarks. Our efforts to identify books from the library and to document their provenance are aided uh, by research into the Jewish library, into the community library, as well by the extant catalogs and the various related information that has been published before the war. The primary identifying uh, future is the community stamps. 
During, the, uh, during its, extent, uh, extent, its existence, the library used five different stamps uh, with both Czech and German inscriptions. The stamps was uh, mainly placed on the title and last pages of books and on the front uh, cover of uh, periodicals. Almost all the books were given their own call number corresponding to the catalog's entry, which was printed on the title page and uh, on the label attached on the cover of spine. The oldest and rarest Hebrew printed books, mostly designed only by letters H and B, was not freely uh, available to library users. These were set aside from the call number series. In addition to records of books from important private collections, specific to which library they came from, books were marked with the letter B for the bibliotheque and with the name of donors. It appears on the book and also on the catalog card. All these records uh, uh, attest to the provenance history of books of uh, community library. For some of the rarest printed books in the library, their provenance was further uh, documented in the published articles by Tobias Jakubovic, wrote, who wrote about uh, the collection we also we refer to all above, uh, we refer to all above mentioned uh, futures when searching for books that are missing from the community library. Let's look at the basic way how to how do we search for the lost books books. Books missing from the um, community library may appear in uh, antiquarian bookshops, auction houses, and online auctions. When viewing the items for sale, we check to see if it has a stamp of the community library. Uh, the first uh, step that we must do is uh, ask to withdraw the book from the sale, because if it will be sell to some individual, it will be again lost. Negotiation for return uh, of a book very depends on whatever it is offered for sale directly by the auction house or bookshop, or if it's uh, um, because this negotiation uh, usually let, lead uh, to its return. In case of a mediated sale, we are put in touch with the processor with whom uh, the negotiation um, might be, however, a little bit complicated. The next way in, in Wallace. Um, Hi, Michael, it's Tula. Michael, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but would you mind clicking on the slide with the stamps, please? On your presentation, yes. thank you. It's people are very eager to see it, um, and unfortunately, we're stuck on this um, first okay, slide. No problem. Thank no problem. you. You're welcome. The next way involves uh, existing database with information about uh, identified original owners, which is searchable by provenance. The relevant database records contains bibliographic information relating to each book the name of the original owner and the name of the institution when the book is uh, currently located. When consulting databases, uh, the name of the library is entered in the search, book, search box, which in the case of the positive result uh, presents a list of the books that were found. We then contact the relevant institution and enter into established by a record from the uh, library uh, pre-war catalogs. Online uh, catalogs, uh, online library catalogs are another source for information we use when tracking down missing books. Bibliographic records for books may describe the original provenance. In our case, information uh, stating that the book in question contains a community library stamp. Such information is uh, only rarely included in the catalog records. That's why we very often need to have to uh, look at the scans of the title pages or entire uh, books for visual check. If we found a record for a book from the community library, we then uh, initiate the ne negotiation for its return. All the mention, uh, mentioned uh, search methods have led us to the recovery for several missing books. Negotiation have taken various lengths of time, sometimes several years. Uh, I hope that I can move a little bit forward. You can see the catalogs of Hebraica and Judaica, we do the pre war catalogs, uh, made no. mostly by Jakubovic. Uh, no, please click on the slide, Michael, if, if it's slide five or six. Okay. 
uh, one of the rarest printed book owned by the Jewish community library, which was not returned after, after its confiscation by the Nazi authorities was the nation edition of the Hebrew Bible, Mikrat Gidolot, often called Rabbinic Bible, which was published by Daniel Bomberg between uh, 1516 and 1517. The community library copy was kept separate from the regular funds. That's why it has no uh, call number, but it has the stamp. The Bible was uh, incorporated into an important large private collection, the Balmadonna Trust Library. Prior to its sale through the New York uh, branch of Sotheby's, the auction house contacted me with a request to identify the ownership uh, stamp on the book. Michael? Yep. Hi. Um, I'm just going to stop you for one second. Uh, perhaps, could you take your um, cursor and click on the slide that you're actually talking about? You see on the left hand, because what we see is the initial slide that says JCLP 1935. So which slide are you on in your presentation? Uh, I'm now showing Sotheby's auction house. Did you, did you see it? No, we cannot. Um, so I don't know what's the problem. You see? Um, no, perhaps, would you mind stop sharing your screen and, and, and try again? I'm sorry, everyone, but uh, I, I, there we go. Yes, now we saw, yes, Sotheby's yes. auction house. Is that where you, is that where you are? Yeah. Perfect. You see? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for interrupting you again. Sorry, everyone. I'm very sorry that you, for the problems. I don't know why. No, no, it's perfect. Please continue. Um, uh, start, um, where after several years, um, as you can see, the image of the stamp was not very uh, easily, you cannot see it very well, but uh, when we asked for more information about the books and some more pictures, we could clearly identify that these books uh, are from a community library. After several years of successful uh, negotiation, the Rabbinical Bible returned home to Prague. You can see another image uh, of the book, also with the uh, record from uh, catalog and also with uh, the mentioning in article uh, written by Jakubowicz. Another rare book from the uh, community library turned up uh, at the auction held by Kastenbaum and company in New York. The volume in question is a reprint of the first edition of Mikna Abraham, a Hebrew grammar book, uh, published by Daniel Bomberg in Venice in 1523. In addition to ownership stamp, the book also contains a call number, uh, which we substantiated uh, with a record from the community bank catalog. Successful negotiation for the return of the book were held at, uh, in collaboration with the Claims Conference and the World Jewish Restitution Organization. Other books from the community library were also offered for sale by the free auction houses in Jerusalem. The first of uh, these auction houses were Venus Unlimited. The second sale was Kedem Auction House, which offered free books printed in Prague in 16th and 17th century. Prague Hebrew printers uh, production is very important for us as the museum focused on the Czech jewelry and its culture. The oldest of these uh, works Charlotte and Chubot Hageonim was published by uh, Prague uh, publisher Mordechai Gershom Hakohen in 1590. The last sale from Israel was a different auction house offering books uh, mostly from 18th century. Now I have to go a little bit back, I'm sorry. Provenance search uh, for books in library holdings has been uh, underway for a longer period of time in Europe than, for example, in the USA. Uh, Germany, in particular, has been rigorous in researching the provenance of collections and has been active in returning books to their original owners. The major German state and university libraries are already publishing the result of their provenance research in the database Looted Culture, Culture Assets. The first institution to have initiated the transfer of books from 
Community Library to Jewish Museum of the Freie Universität Berlin. Excuse uh, me, Michael, excuse me. Would you please move the slide to where you're speaking right now? Uh, because we don't, it, it's still on the slide number 17 and it looks like you're moved on with the presentation to a different topic. Is it better now? Now it's, we were on 12. So if this is what you're talking about, that would be correct. Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, um, uh, four books that have been identified uh, in the above mentioned uh, database uh, will be returned to Prague from Hochschule für Jüdische Studien Heidelberg. Represent uh, representatives of the funds in the library catalogs are from USA as well from Europe. I start with Germany. We have identified one of the library catalog uh, of the Universitätsbibliothek Gießen and it will return to the uh, museum this year. Two books are uh, in Staatsbibliothek to Berlin. In this case too, the Berlin State uh, Library has agreed to hand over these books. Negoti negotiation in the United States are also progressing well. Uh, six uh, 19th century printed books have been discovered in the catalog of the Uni University of California, Los Angeles Library. Um, you will hear more about it uh, from Diane. In addition, we have uh, identified uh, 90, uh, 29 books from the community library in the library catalog of Washington University in St. Louis, uh, based on provenance data available on the website of the Shimon Breisman collection in the Jewish studies. Uh, these are mostly 19th century printed books and uh, they also uh, include books from 16th and 17th century. An agreement has also been reached uh, with this university library and the books will return to, uh, hopefully, hopefully this year. So you can see, I hope you see uh, the Washington University catalog with the entry uh, mentioning Prague, Israel Kultusgemeinde Bibliothek. Over the years, some of the books from a community library has been incorporated uh, in the collection of Jewish uh, institution outside the Czech Republic. In these cases, we have to put forward our arguments and establish our claims to the books with respect and in a more intensive way. The, legis the legitimacy of our claims uh, is often put into question by the role and mission of the current possessor possessors of books. This is because they um, the they consider uh, themselves to be the rescuers of Nazi plundered Jewish property and the successor of heirs of uh, Europe's former Jewish communities and institution. Uh, we argue that the Prague Jewish community was uh, active not only during, but also right after the Second World War and immediately search uh, for its confiscated property, which is why Jewish Museum insists on its claims to recover the books. I switch to last one. We trust that we will be able to recover the identified books uh, that are missing from the community library. In so doing, we will move closer to our goal and this mission of owning and making available to the public the community library in its most authentic uh, form. Uh, thank you for your attention and sorry for some technical problems. Uh, thank you, Michael. Now let's move on. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Diane Mizrahi, uh, who completed her Master's of Library Science degree at Ba'ilan University in Israel. Uh, her thesis explores the concept of library anxiety. She began working at UCLA in 2002 and is currently the social sciences librarian and librarian for Jewish and Israel studies. Diane completed her PhD in information studies at UCLA in 2011. Her, uh, most of her research and publications focus on information literacy and students, um, print and electronic reading behaviors. 
uh, but she's currently immersed in the history and impact of Nazi looted books from academic libraries. Uh, welcome, Dr. Diane Mizrahi. Well, thank you, and thank you everybody for um, joining us today. Um, I'm actually broadcasting from my brother-in-law's uh, place in Perach Tikva, Israel, uh, outside of Tel Aviv, but I'm very excited to be with everyone today. So we have heard from the earlier speakers about the history of the Jewish Museum in Prague and its library and some context of books in the Holocaust in general. I'm going to speak to you about the efforts the UCLA Library has made to return six looted books to Prague. I'll start with the initial communications from the Jewish Museum, then the steps we devised to verify and repatriate the books, how we believe they came to be in our collection, how and why we are publicizing this case and our goals for the future. In June 2021, I received an email from Mr. Ivan Kahout, curator at the Jewish Museum in Prague, explaining that by how using Hati Trust, an online full text database, he identified three volumes in the UCLA library with ownership stamps and accession numbers matching their 1939 catalog. This library was one of the tens of thousands of libraries across Europe that were looted by the Nazis during World War II, and the reconstituted museum was trying to rebuild their original library collection. He gently requested our co cooperation in returning these volumes. Here are the, the three books, all works of Judaica in Hebrew, Sefer HaGeonim, Sefer HaSherushim, and Yesod Moray. And you can see clearly on each title page, the ownership stamp of the um, Jewish Museum. And at least on uh, Yosod More on the right, you can see at the bottom, 2020, that is the uh, Prague's accession number. Since our initial communications, we have uncovered three more books in our, in our collection that belong to Prague. Two of them we found using Hati Trust, and um, a second one, um, which is Ktab Sofer here in the middle, um, I found among a, a backlog of unprocessed material. Ktab Sofer in the middle is a Hebrew book on Judaica, and the other two are volumes in French. Again, on the title pages, you clearly see the ownership stamps of the museum in Prague, and you can see two of the accession numbers at the bottom, down here and over here. So what do you do? Well, this wasn't the first time as we heard from university librarian Ginny Steele. It's not the first time that the UCLA library was asked to repatriate a Nazi looted book. In 2019, Ginny, the, who is the Norman and Armina Powell university librarian, received an inquiry from the Jewish community in Munich asking for the return of a treatise on the topic of circumcision which was published in Ansbach, Germany in 1844. It had been part of the community libraries that was um, looted by the Gestapo during Kristallnacht in 1938. Ms. Steele stated that it was unclear how the UCLA library acquired it, but it must have been sometime before 80, uh, 1986 when we cataloged it. There were no procedures, protocols, or workflows in place at UCLA to handle this request, and administrators did not find any professional literature that could provide guidance. They therefore identified steps in consultation with the leaders of the various units that had had responsibility for any aspect of the book's life while it was here at UCLA, including our acquisitions and metadata services, preservation, and the Southern Regional Library Facility, SRLF, which is the storage facility on campus that provides space for materials from across the UC system. So all items in process in question were checked physically and verified by finding the Prague library stamps and the accession numbers that matched the corresponding entries in their pre-World War II catalog. After the print verifications, every page of the electronic copies were 
compared to their physical, physical originals to ensure completeness and legibility. Thus, UCLA scholars and others will continue to have access to the truest digital versions possible. We decided to rescan one of the volumes in order to improve its legibility. The book from the backlog will be scanned and entered into Hati Trust. On WorldCat, which is a comprehensive catalog of libraries worldwide, we found that at least one other institution holds a copy of each book, and therefore our volumes are not singularly unique. We amended our catalog to show that we withdrew the physical copies and to provide links to the digital versions. Our conservation and preservation department checked and treated each volume as needed to, against insects or mold or any damage that could be repaired. And we asked the Prague curators whether they wished for us to remove all signs of UCLA ownership. They said no, and we happily agreed. Books could have been inadvertently damaged during any erasure uh, process, and the UCLA signs add another chapter, so to speak, to each book's history. Here on the um, upper left side, this is from the original uh, 1939 catalog. And the first entry on that, in that catalog, which is um, enlarged down at the bottom, is this history of Jewish uh, doctors, which was printed in Brussels in 1844. And it has the accession number of 7055. And here we see the book, the title page of the book, as it is in our collection, with the ownership stamp and the matching accession number. And this is how we verified the physical books. So how did they get to UCLA? Well, at this time, we cannot determine precisely how the looted books ended up in our library, but we can make some well-founded assumptions. As we heard, after the war, Western allies were left with a quandary of what to do with all of these millions of books. Um, the US Army established the Offenbach Archival Depository, where their official po policy was to return material to their owners or descendants or the country of origin. This was fine when the owners could be identified and located, but most of the material were orphaned works. Their owners or heirs could not be identified or found, which raised all kinds of ethical issues. After the army left, the work was continued by the Jewish Cultural uh, Reconstruction Organization. And after many negotiations, they decided to distribute the orphaned works to the National Library of Israel and to universities and institutions in Jewish communities in North America, Australia, South America, and elsewhere. At the same time, however, as we heard from Professor Leff, many libraries, institutions, commercial enterprises, and individuals sent their own representatives to Europe to scour among the remains for items to add to their collections and inventories. It's also possible that among the, along the years, as some books were purchased by collectors and book dealers from the Nazis during the war, or taken as souvenirs from, uh, by allied soldiers or others, and then sold to dealers or donated to collections. We believe that UCLA acquired the Prague Library books during a major purchasing campaign in the 1960s. UCLA was established in 1919 and is therefore is a relatively young research university. Jewish studies began only in the 1950s. As interest in Jewish studies grew and more courses were offered, the library needed to expand its resources to support scholarship and coursework. It was in a fortunate financial position to purchase significant amounts of material in the 1960s. A major boost to the collection was the acquisition of the entire inventory of 33,520 volumes from the Bamberger and Varman bookstore in Jerusalem, which closed for business in 1963. The purchase was initiated by Professor Arnold Band and was enabled by a generous gift from the Cummings family of Beverly Hills. The, the items from that purchase are now distinguished as the Cummings Collection with an identifying book plate. One of the Prague Library books contains that book plate. 
indicating that it was acquired in this transaction. At that time, UCLA assigned sequential accession numbers to each book as they were acquired. All six of the PROG items discovered so far uh, have similar UCLA accession numbers, which are very close in proximity. This indicates that they were acquired around the same time when our library holdings were only about 2 million volumes. Today, we have over 12 million volumes. It suggests that they were all obtained and processed in the early to mid 1960s. It thus appears that the Prague Library volumes were purchased from uh, booksellers and dealers in Israel and elsewhere, but further investigation is needed to ascertain more precise information. Here are snapshots of the um, UCLA accession numbers from each of the six uh, books that we are returning. And you can see they start at 207, 208, 209, 209, 2100, 211. So that proximity, again, is the indication that they were acquired right around the same time. And by the, the number of volumes in our collection at that time, it was, we de deduced that it was the 1960s, the mid 1960s. Uh, on the left, this is an article from the, the Los Angeles Times dated April 19th, 1963, which details the acquisition because it was very big news. And on the right, we see the book plate designating the books that were part of this Cummings collection. This one is from Sefer Hegeonim, one of the books that we are returning to the Prague Library. As we began this process, the UCLA Library understood that the repatriation of Nazi looted books from academic library collections is a vital ethical issue. Unlike the previous occasion, we decided to publish this case as widely as possible and expand upon the topic in a series of events. With the current rise of anti-Semitism and Holocaust denial worldwide, and because of continued book censorship in the United States and elsewhere, it is imperative to remind our public of the crimes that were committed. Teaching about the ongoing process of restitution efforts in libraries and museums and demonstrating a commitment to this process is crucial. As of this writing, our library has been engaged in several events and programs. Last week, we held a symbolic handover event with a council general from the Czech Republic. It was highlighted by a video from the curators at the Jewish Museum in Prague and remarks from representatives of the Israeli consulate. This is a picture from that event. The event was intimate, only about 25 attendees, but we have since reported it through various social media the library communications and the UCLA campus weekly newsletter in order to inform a broader public. Simultaneously, my colleagues mounted a beautiful online exhibit detailing the story of our repatriation efforts. If you haven't had a chance to view it, I highly recommend doing so. Maybe Tula can put the, uh, the URL up um, for that, for the, uh, for the exhibit. The Prague case served as a catalyst to broaden the discussion of repatriation and restitution of items from communities worldwide through this symposium series, which is sponsored by the library and in collaboration with the Alan D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies. We have written academic articles, which are currently under review, as well as proposals for upcoming conference presentations. The library is developing plans to review our holdings for uncovering um, other material of questionable provenance. And I personally am convinced that we will find many, many more. And it has become apparent that the staff throughout the library system should be vigilant for provenance signs. Subject specialists, catalogers, members of digitization teams, special collections staff, acquisitions, international interlibrary loan staff, Preservation specialists, student workers, reshelving books, and others may all come across such material at some time. They may see an ownership stamp in a volume, but not realize its potential, or they may overlook it entirely. So we plan to raise awareness among our staff by creating and distributing a graphic or poster in which we would illustrate various ownership stamps from looted collections and remind staff to contact the relevant 
subject specialist for further clarification if found. So as libraries everywhere continue the digitization of their precious works, opening them up to scholarship worldwide, the possibility of finding material of questionable provenance grows. This issue goes beyond recovering Nazi loot. We must be aware of the possibility of finding material in library stacks from other areas where war and violence have ravaged libraries, archives, and communities. Members of the art and museum worlds have been grappling with these issues for decades. Some European libraries have created collaborations for restitution, but it is time for North American librarians to step up as well. A couple weeks ago, I was privileged to, to converse with two members of the International Forum on Judaica Provenance. This forum is a recent initiative of the National Library of Israel and the Association of Jewish Libraries. They have brought together 13 curators and scholars from art, law, history, and Judaica from seven countries with the goal, goal of developing a white paper of recommendations. This white paper could serve as a model for other communities as well. So now we are full circle. Nearly 80 years after the, wall, after the war, the library has this opportunity to play a small part in helping to rectify an historic injustice. The process has been immensely satisfying on a personal and professional level for me, and I believe for my colleagues as well. Um, in these pictures, you see the ancient synagogue in Prague on the left, and on the right, you see that's me inside the ancient synagogue with a local um, uh, is, um, survivor of the Theresienstadt concentration camp. So I want to thank you all for joining us with this moment today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mizrahi. And uh, now uh, our last speaker is uh, Russell Johnson, who has been curator for history of medicine and the sciences at UCLA Library Special Collections since 2008. Uh, he holds master's degrees in physiological psychology, now known as behavioral neuroscience and library and information studies. Uh, Russell was honored twice as UCLA Librarian of the Year in 2009 for building a collection of baby record books, which opened up a new um, area in historical childhood studies. And in 2019 for mentorship and outreach, including not noteworthy teaching with rare and unique materials. Uh, welcome Russell Johnson. Thank you. Uh, the story I will tell in a short time is just an outline. On March 31st, 1933, a boy, two girls, and their grandmother traveled by train from Stuttgart, Germany to Switzerland. Later that evening, they were followed by automobile by their parents, Felicia Hirsch and the 38-year-old decade-long head of otorhinolaryngology, or the ear, nose, and throat department, at the Marianne Hospital in Stuttgart, Dr. Cesar Hirsch. Today, the hospital notes that their first chief doctor of the Halls Nasen Orden Clinic, the, no, the throat, nose, and ear clinic, was the first Jewish physician at the hospital who must flee from the Nazis. Cesar's son, Peter, related that his mother said his father was harassed by the person whose house they had bought, and this person was seen in an SS uniform. This also was the eve of the announced economic boycott of Jewish-owned businesses and the offices of Jewish professionals. Peter told us, quote, the mo my mother said that no one in our family would be safe, and she insisted that we leave immediately. If we had not left, our family history would be quite different. A Stolperstein, or memorial stumbling block, one of the more than 800 in Stuttgart, now marks where Hirsch's house stood at 60 Birkenwaldstrasse. After he and his family fled in 1933, the Gestapo prevented friends from re removing and delivering belongings across the border to him and then seized his property. He had demüchtigt, entrechtet, flucht, humiliated, disenfranchised, escaped. 
the family went, oops, uh, the family went from Switzerland to France, then to New York, where the, where the children's last name was changed to Hearst in a move to assimilate. In 1939, Dr. Hirsch went on to Seattle ahead of his family, obtaining licensure in the state of Washington, but the offer to join an existing practice was withdrawn, and he ended up in a small Seattle office with hardly any patients. In 1940, uh, at the age of 54, having given up hope, Dr. Hirsch completed his Flucht an den Tod, his death, his flight into death by suicide. We know all this and so much more because of investigative work by Hans Joachim Lang. As a journalist then for a Tübingen newspaper, he was researching without success what happened to the library there of Goethe scholar Ludwig Spiro. In 1999, Lang stumbled, stumbled on a reference to Cesar Hirsch an unfamiliar name to him and his books in the Tübingen Library holdings. He later told us, quote, I found a biography of Georg Ley, the director of the University Library from 1921 to 1947. In his biography, I found these two simple sentences, quote, moreover, in January 1938, the confiscated library of Jewish immigrant Dr. Cesar Hirsch was transferred by the Stuttgart Gestapo to the University Library for temporary safekeeping. The private library, which contains valuable periodicals on autology, was turned over to, to the University Library in 1940 for 1,000 Reichsmarks. Long found that the uh, Gestapo delivered 29 crates of Hirsch's books to the University Library in 1938. In 1940, the library kept and shelf marked or labeled some of the confiscated books and journals for its collection and sold duplicates to the secondhand shop for 400 Reichsmarks. There is no remaining record on what happened to these reprints, theses, and other books. In 1949, Cesar's widow and son, Peter Hurst, started pursuing some restitution for the confiscated house and its contents. In 1999, Long used internet-based directories to find Peter living in California and contacted him about the story he was publishing. Everhard Scheich, the rector of Tübingen's university, then offered Hirsch's heirs the return of the library, which had not been in the original 1933 house inventory by the revenue office, and the ball was rolling. I must emphasize the spirit of cooperation that brought the collection to UCLA. James Sporer, the Sporer at UC Berkeley reviewed the assembled volumes in Germany in April 2000, graciously welcomed by the director of the library at Tübingen. Karen Butter at UC San Francisco, where Peter's her son was and is on the medical faculty, considered the books and journals and then referred them on to us. UCLA's Kathy Donahue and Allison Bunting accepted the collection in March 2001 as a physician's working library of chiefly late 19th and early 20th century medical books in German, English, French, Italian, and Spanish, many of which we did not have. The volumes are mostly mundane. There are no treasures, but that in itself shows how routine and methodical and comprehensive the confiscation of Jewish property was. We committed to taking and keeping everything when it arrived in June 2001, as far back as a rare 1660 work, which, like most of the volumes, included the shelf mark label applied by the Tubing and Library. There are a couple of journal title pages which bear the ownership inscription Cesar Hirsch, but for the most part, the volumes are unremarkable, and there are no ink stamps or markings or other physical evidence which indicate that Gestapo agents handled them. We, are, we committed to taking and keeping everything, such as a long run of the important journal Archive for Oren Heilkunde, but also the regional auto club directory, which included Hirsch's membership. We tell the ownership story in notes in the catalog record and in a unique special collections and archives code, which can be summoned to intellectually gather all of the catalog records together for volumes which may be physically housed in different places based on their format or subject-based call number. In 2002, we announced receiving 191 book titles and 37 journal titles, but upon cataloging, determined we had 733 bound volumes distributed across 221 titles, 169 books or monographs, one dissertation, two conference proceedings, and 49 runs of journals. 
I wonder if there are other Hirsch books out there waiting to be rediscovered. We have fixed a special book plate to each volume and described Hirsch's and Tubingen's former ownership in each catalog record. The ability to identify and reconstitute this remaining library speaks to our obligation as librarians to commit the effort to fully describe and distinguish our holdings for discovery, access, and use, because each copy of a book or journal or piece of ephemera has a story, a life beyond its generic digital surrogate. In our cataloging, we record what the Canadian painter Matthew Wong, who himself died by suicide just before the pandemic, and is profiled in this week's New Yorker, described as, quote, the residue and traces of human activity. I am deeply saddened that Dr. Hirsch's surviving library does not contain any copies of his own work, a textbook and 120 papers. I recently learned through a biography that a successor, Leo Martin Reich, at the Marianne Hospital wrote in 2009, that Hirsch was an editor of the journal Pain and in 1929 led several workshops on the subject of analgesia or pain relief in the US. History of pain research and pain management is one of our core collecting areas through the John C. Leviskin History Pain Collection and its endowment. So now I also feel a commitment to help pain researchers learn Hirsch's role, cut short. There's so much more to say about Cesar Hirsch and his family in context such as explaining a photo, not this one, but one which I have seen but don't have, in Princeton, New Jersey, of Mrs. Hirsch alongside Jenny Einstein, who was the wife of Otto Einstein, the Hirsch's pediatrician in Stuttgart, and Otto's physicist cousin, Albert. For now, I point biography to biographies such as Suzanne Royce's monograph on Stuttgart medical personnel. And an excellent Wikipedia entry and more but finally, there is something that caught my eye in Cesar Hirsch's formal portrait. The eye mirror he wears, a signature piece of equipment on which an ENT would depend to reflect a bright light into a patient's ear, nose, or oral cavity, while he peered into the lit space through a tiny hole in the center of the mirror. He didn't polish the mirror before his portrait was made. It is covered with his finger and thumbprints, which, which I love because it makes this formal portrait into one of a very much working doctor whose working library we are fortunate to have and make accessible to anyone to use in our university with the blessing of Dr. Hirsch's family and the hard work of Hans Joachim Lang and many academicians and librarians. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Uh, let's go straight to our uh, questions for the sake of time. Uh, so, first question uh, is for Dr. Lisa Lev. Uh, thank you for an excellent presentation. Please elaborate on your intent in terming this as strange restitution. Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, yeah, strange, because we think of restitution as going back I mean, to the, first of all, to the individual owners or to the original owners, including individuals. And in this case, um, restitution for indiv to individuals was almost, um, was for the most part, not even sought or tried because it was assumed to be impossible. And then um, strange also because within the context of international law, Jews did not exist. Um, so the decision, at least with the airless books, to return things to Jews was quite unusual um, and to take them to other countries. And it was a kind of, you know, um, you know, they did this at a time before Israel was, this decision was taken before Israel was even a state, right? This was to Jewish cultural reconstruction as somehow representing the Jews and then a distribution that that organization made. Um, to um, libraries that were understood to be places where Jews could use them. Um, that's what I mean by strange. I don't mean um, to make a, a ethical judgment though. I think as one of the other questions seems to suggest, there's complicated ethics there. It's not um, all good or all bad and the post history of it as you kind of see here, um, leads to more complications where nothing's ever settled, right? And there are 
uh, later when European institutions, European Jewish institutions are at, in fact, show themselves um, again, uh, ready to be home to these books. Um, you know, American institutions or Israeli institutions find themselves in a quandary, what should be done now? And I think that's what's so amazing about this panel is to see that long history and the continued grappling by librarians to find a way to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I mean, there are not only legal issues, but also ethical issues here. So yeah, that's complicated. The next question, uh, Dr. Lev's presentation was very informative, but it must be stated that sometimes taking matters into one's own hands can be dangerous. This is what has happened in many Caribbean and Latin American countries, and in particular in Cuba, when wealthy people fleeing revolution saved important documents in archives po post positing uh, that the new governments cannot take care of them properly. So it's more of a comment, I guess, than a um, direct question. Um, unless you want to comment. I was just going to say, ab absolutely. And I think we see some of that in this in this story that we saw in four parts today or, or angles on in four parts today that when you have a process like this, there's going to be both legal and extra legal. And in the story with what happened with Jewish books, there's so much extra legal going on around the edges. And then, um, you know, the ethical questions on top of them. And one shouldn't just um, celebrate, you know, the, the extra legal. At the same time, one must be aware of the, the limits of the law and the, this extra legal circulation of books and their um, acquisition by libraries. You know, hopefully, it, it sounds like a lot of what's happening in the librarian um, world these days is trying to figure out policies that can better deal with this, that don't just say, um, as long as things wound up in a place that takes good care of them, it's all for the best that we're trying to move beyond that mentality, um, which pervaded the field for so long. But um, maybe other professional librarians want to speak to this. And you would, one would like to comment on this or should we move on to the next question? Uh, we have still a few. Um, let me read another one for the sake of provenance research and determining to whom a given book should be returned, does a stamp, book plate, or ownership signature always prove current ownership? Books can be sold, uh, deaccessioned, or given away without documentation. If I could jump in here, yeah. Um, sometimes you, you will see multiple provenance marks in a book and determining the order of them is is not easy at all. Um, so so I mean, the first step, a, a big step that we need to do as librarians is to in the, in our catalog records put what the the ink stamps and the inscriptions and the book plates and 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 all those marks are into the record, so that they are discoverable by people who are more familiar with the names and the institutions than we are as librarians, I think. Okay, thank you. Another one uh, that scholarship is underway re regarding uh, collecting practices by US libraries post-war, particularly those that build collections with inexpensively and perhaps unethically in Europe after the Holocaust. Um, what additional records are scholars using to reconstruct the pathways of the post-war book trade? Looking forward to, um, to reviewing the research guide. Uh, since a couple of things that were mentioned there were, were biomedical. Um, so having things like the, the, um, the archives of a collector, the archives of of booksellers at UCLA has several archives of booksellers. And with our major medical collection, John Benjamin, we have his correspondence and invoices and such with all the booksellers that he worked with. 
So, for example, if, if we can identify a particular bookseller um, after World War II that would be of great interest because of where they might have gotten the books, we can, we can hone in on things like that. Um, okay, thank you. Let me get to this question. Uh, it's a bit lengthy, but let me read it out. Uh, so far, the talks have primarily addressed institutional collections and their dispersal and restitution attempts. In my experience, individual rare book collectors collect in their areas of expertise. So physicians often collect rare books in medicine. Rarely do these books have any identifying marks with the thinking that it, that it harms the value of the book. Big books, such works as uh, Versalius, Harvey, Fox, Celsus, et cetera, would probably have been confiscated and then just disappear into the antiquarian book trade. Have any titles such as these been recovered or are there attempts to identify individual Jewish rare book collectors in order um, what happened to such now extremely rare and valuable books? I can say something about that. Um, just that at Offenbach, you know, the the one of the interesting first things that they did there was to, for large collections that did have um, book plates in them, um, whether they were from individuals or from institutions, they did take photographs of all of those book plates and then make a book of them and circulate them to see, to be able to identify whose they were. So there was some attempt with large collections that they could tell were collections even those that belong to individuals like the Rothschilds had a famous book collection that was found there um, to try to return them to individuals. But otherwise, as you're saying, um, the, the allies wanted to move fast and they did not think they were in a position to be able to deal with individual books and instead treated them as collective property. And we're still dealing with the fallout of that many um, decades later. Okay, thank you. Here's one specific question. How did Hirsch acquire the Schneider book, which it looks like it came from a library? Yeah, unfortunately, we, we, we don't have any of uh, Hirsch's own archives. Um, of course, we would know that he acquired this before 19, 1933 or earlier. Um, and no, I'm, not sure that I can make out the, the, the previous ownership marks in, in that volume, but, but when we can, we, we, we note that, that's, that something is there um, for further investigation. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's one question about the logistics of the whole process. How did you CLA go about contacting the Czech consulate? And is there a standard for reaching out to other governments uh, when artifacts, books, materials are discovered in collections? Um, thank you. That's a, a great question. Um, it's, it's all about who you know. So we have um, a colleague of mine who is herself from, uh, from, Czech, from the Czech Republic, and she knew somebody in the consulate, and it was through her connection that we were able to bring in the council general. And it, our um, efforts with the, uh, the Israeli uh, representatives were also somebody knew somebody who knew somebody in the consulate. Um, and so, yeah, it, it came down to who you know, but... Um, yeah, there are efforts to, to the, I think the more that we get a story out there, the councils themselves will say, hey, this could be affecting my communities or, or people in my, um, in, my, in my country. And so they hopefully there will be, um, have their ears open, their, their ears and their eyes open to other instances and um, which would be ideal. Uh Thank you. Now, another question is about um, online depositories, repositories. So has UCLA done further systematic research in Hathi Trust? Uh, and are you aware of other libraries or organizations who are systematically looking for these items in Hathi Trust? 
we have um, a plan that is, um, I, I hope this summer will begin to actuate. Um, it, we haven't developed all of the uh, fine points, but um, because there are probably hundred, well, we have several thousand books in Hathi Trust, um, and not all of them are of Judaica, but they may be of questionable, some may be of questionable provenance. So we, um, we haven't yet set out the exact uh, plan. I don't want to uh, talk about the, the details because they are not quite certain at this time, but um, that is one of our goals because we feel so strongly and just going through some of our items in our special collections, um, they, uh, I see ownership stamps from various um, institutions, European institutions that I I'm going to have to research. And as uh, Michael pointed out, there are various databases that um, European libraries um, have developed and so by consulting with them, I think it's the Brisman um, uh, uh, collection that they have uh, many of the, uh, the um, ownership stamps and markings. And so I think we're going to have to start moving um, all of us together. I don't know of any other institution in North America who is doing a review of um, their holdings, but I do know that this um, is going on in Europe. I think one thing that this also brings up is that as there are campaigns to eliminate some duplicates in collections because uh, of, of so much digitization going on, but the digitization is of one copy somewhere. Um, and a, is a duplicate truly a du duplicate when you start looking at the, the provenance information or particular physical characteristics, hand coloring versus not colored and so forth. Um, it, it, it's, it's a lot more effort than uh, just weeding. Thank you. There is a follow-up question for uh, Diane Mizrahi. Uh, so for an institution that may not have those connections, what suggestions would you make for contacting consulates? Um, well, it, it obviously it depends on the council uh, and the, um, like the Czech council was very open and you can go to their, um, the, the Los Angeles branch and you can go to their website and get, um, get information and, and contact information. Um, other councils, they um, a bit more uh, oblique and uh, not as easily penetrable, but um, I think it, you just have to start with the even going down there and if you're in the in the general area, we're fortunate in Los Angeles that most um, most of the countries have representatives in right practically in our neighborhood. And so, um, you know, even going down and saying I'm a librarian from here and this is what we're doing and we have books that we think belong to communities in your um, in your country and we would like to have a dialogue with you. Um, but, you know, starting with the phone calls and, and the, and the um, and I even did WhatsApp with the Israeli um, council and uh, email and just trying to penetrate through and then finding out maybe even among your faculty or your um, research centers, somebody may have had an event where they, um, where they invited a representative from a council or an embassy or a community, and they were able to make that connection that way. So even among your own, um, not just necessarily librarians, but um, other researchers in your, your community or other researchers that you know may have some kind of connection and be able to, to say, oh, I know this person and they can get you through, so. Uh, thank you. Uh, so maybe we'll try to squeeze one more question in uh, here. It's a short question, it might be complicated. I'm wondering about the relationship between these restitution efforts and Zionist state building. I'd be happy to say something about that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I mentioned the Gershom Sholem kind of uh, mission to Europe that also he went through Prague, I should have said that as well, before he went to Offenbach and um, how many things um, as a representative of Hebrew University, he um, identified and uh, got um, to Jerusalem to become part of, you know, the, the ideology there is um, very Jewish nationalist. It's about building a Jewish state. And if there's going to be a Jewish state, 
Um, there should be a, a national and university library uh, that holds the collections of things that are relevant. You know, this is part of nationalism. But I think one of the things that's so interesting about what happened in the aftermath of World War II with the book restitution is that it's not only Zionist. There is a Zionist element um, that's part of the story. And then there's this North America, you know, the, the biggest beneficiaries of Jewish cultural reconstruction were in were institutions in North America. Um, foremost among those, the seminaries, um, Jewish Theological Seminary in New York and Hebrew Union College got the biggest collections. So it's um, a multifaceted Jewish project to um, keep cultural life connected, you know, to, for Jews to be able to stay connected to these books that were part of the past. And I, I'd like to add that um, that there were uh, scholars in, in North America, Lisa, maybe you um, can say that the names, who did not believe that we should be concentrating too many books in one place because of the, um, the, the ever hanging threat over the Jewish people of annihilation. And if you have all of this one concentration where all Jewish scholarship, all Jewish work is held and something, uh, God forbid, happens, then all of that work goes with it. So there were many differences of opinion and um, a lot of individual actors and agents as well. Well, thank you so much. Um, at this point, we end over time, so we need to close. I would like to thank you all for those remarkable presentations, uh, conveying all these extraordinary stories. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and if, um, you know, just continue to check our guide, and we'll have um, Jeannie's video on there, and people's links to people's um, presentations or um, the videos of um, this panel, and any other extra information. And, and please, please, please um, do the survey. I know um, we had a lot of technical difficulties in the beginning, but um, there was a lot of good information, and we hope to see you in the other programs. Thank you.